again, folks. Um, today we're going to be starting uh, chapter six, and we'll specifically be doing uh, six one and six two. All right. If you want, not that I would force you if you didn't, but uh, to separate out in your notes, uh, maybe take a piece of paper like this and fold down the corners. So you make a divider. I always, I always tell my students that, and the reason is because. Uh, I learned that when I was in third grade by probably the best teacher in the entire world. Her name was Miss Cabilio. Um, anyhow, and one of the skills that you teach a child, since you folks are presumably going into uh, grammar school education, elementary education, one of the skills that you have to impart to a child is basically how to be organized. So that's a minor thing, I understand, but it helps, you know. You work with the resources you have. Simple thing like that. Okay? Alright. So we're going to be discussing algebra. Right. Um, a couple of things. Math in general is a linear thought process. And if there's a reason why um, people resist it, I think it's just because they don't have that natural inclination to think linearly. So we have to teach them that, right? And it's possible. I, you know, some people feel that, oh, I'm not a math person, it's not for me. That's not true, right? Uh, another thing that you must impart to your students is that they can, in fact, be a math person, all right? Even if they didn't come that way, all right? They could be a convert. I myself feel that that's, I'm a convert, all right? To, to, the, to the church of math, if you will, okay? So, um, it's not the only perspective of the universe, but it happens to be a practical one, all right? And it takes some acclimating, it takes some getting used to. But the key, the key phrase, the operative term is linear, all right? It's a very linear, straightforward thinking thought process. So, um, with that in mind, let me give you a quick little rundown, all right? Because I think this is interesting. If you were going to put math on a timeline, okay, you're not really responsible for this. Right? Here's a timeline. It's probably counting number sense, you know, that came first. And we have no specific date for that, so you might even say that it's prehistoric. You know, it's intuitive to us, right, to count. Right? We have digits, I mean, even the word that comes from Latin later, but uh, our fingers, right? We are born mostly, you know, with ten fingers and ten toes, all right? And some ancestor must have realized that this is a quantity, you know? Anyhow, whether they wrote it down or not, all right, that number sense, all right, that there's an amount of something, Right. One, one amount is perhaps greater than a different amount. Even animals have a number sense. If you gave them two different plates of food in one big pile and one small acorn, they would go to the big pile. You know. That might be prehistory. Right? Um, as far as arithmetic is concerned, um, that's when we have actual written symbols of some sort right? and the operations. Like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. All right. Uh, I'll give you a rough estimate of time. This is not something you're going to be testing on, but let's just say 5,000 BC, you know, to maybe 500 CE or AD. All right. BCE before the Common Era and then the Common Era. All right. Um, geometry also around this time. It would make sense that arithmetic perhaps was first, but concurrent with uh, geometry. And then there's algebra, which is what we're getting into now. Um, the reason that I mention it is because there's a, a linear even thought process, an evolution of math sense, if you will. All right? Basic counting, written language, a written numer a numeral system. All right, and things that you do to those numerals, operations, right, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Geometry has to do with shapes, of course. All right. um, 
Algebra is much further in the timeline of human history, right? It's medieval. All right, so, um, say something like 500 CD inklings of that to about 1500, roughly. Uh, and a figure of work uh, knowing is Al Khwarizmi. who I believe is the person who coined the phrase even algebra. Algebra is a corruption of Arabic, most likely algebar. Forgive my mispronunciation. Um, Al-Khwarizmi wrote basically the first textbook on the subject in 825, thereabouts. Anyhow, algebra, um, is naturally incorporating earlier systems, but algebra, if you were going to specify, right, it's it's a technique. Right? Right. Geometry might be limited now. This is an oversimplification, but it involves a lot of formulas naturally because you're dealing with shapes, right? Relationships, angle relationships, perhaps. All right. Arithmetic is, you know, the numerals, things that you do to them. You know, add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them. All right. But algebra is a technique, all right, of balance. There's the key phrase there. It's a balancing act. Okay. As for the things that follow, um, again, you're not responsible for any of this, but um, trigonometry and statistics follow. And really, the next big thing is calculus. Right? And calculus um, is from about maybe 1700 to the present. Right? It's something that's presumably in development still, but right? um, Isaac Newton, all right, famously uh, one of the uh, two people, Leibniz, I never pronounced the poor man's name correctly, Leibniz and uh, Newton, all the two figures of note. All right. um, and calculus is a more sophisticated form of algebra, really, all right. and also a more sophisticated form of geometry. All right. and you could find, for example, um, the volume of irregular shapes, all right. irregular three-dimensional shapes using calculus. Right. It comes from basically um, two or three problems where algebra may have people hit a brick wall, all right? And so this, this thought process was developed, all right? About that time. I'm not doing any justice right now, but we're really responsible for this, all right? Just beware, algebra follows arithmetic and geometry in time, and it comes from basically the Middle Ages, all right? It's a balancing act. It's a thought process, a technique. Okay. Now, um, let's get down to brass tacks here and put that there. I should get a which calls it uh, a napkin, pardon me. I'm going to have to wipe my board. packet that I have for you today, um, is, looks like this is the first page, um, there's a lot of terminology for algebra and there are some things that have two different names, so um, meaning there's two different contexts depending upon the circumstances. To clarify, all right, I made this uh, sort of a, what do you call it, a vocabulary uh, Box. What does I call that? I don't know what's the word. A word bank. All right. 
And I want to fill that in with you just to, to elucidate here. There's some other papers here, I just flashed them really quick, that I have made for this lesson, or these two lessons. This I stole from the textbook. And some word problems at the back. So if you want to print that out as we go along, that would be cool. All right. Um, I, under normal circumstances, when I'm in a, a real legit classroom, uh, I like to project that onto a board. I can't do that here because I just don't have the, uh, the equipment. Um, what I will do is try to simulate um, some of these. The, the diagram that I have asked you to print this space. Well, I'll get rid of this. Okay. Um, I purposely made this in colors because I'm hoping, and I would encourage you to do that too. It is a bit time consuming, but when you make worksheets or whatever for your students, um, put them in different colors. It makes it a little bit easier to emphasize and for them to see. Uh, a good rule of thumb also, don't put red near green, at least not adjacent immediately. Uh, because if you're cover blind, it's difficult to distinguish those two things. So be, do be considerate. Okay. This is one side of the board. That one is going to have to be replaced. I'll put this here. And then there's these. Similar looking uh, figures here. but I don't have, I have but four colors. <laughs> this is the package that I purchased from uh, ShopRite or what have you. Um, again, I, not to double talk here, but when you type something, all right, if you're going to, you know, in an effort to make it as clear as possible to distinguish the uh, individual parts, if you will, all right, do make them in different colors. It makes it easier for a kid to, to see and notice them. All right, anyhow. Um, you could take this word bank, if you are inclined, and proceed to fill in the labels for these individual parts, all right? And if you're a little sketchy, then you and me, I will do it. All right, first things first, all right? The fancy way of saying numbers sitting up in front of letter, all right? That is a coefficient. bones about, about it, all right? The name for the letter that is attached to the number, all right, is variable. I admit, I just like to just, you know, say letter, all right? <laughs> Here's your letter, all right? But um, a, a more sophisticated way of speaking would be to call it a variable. Why? Because it could vary, it could be anything, all right? In theory, all right? That's one context of it, all right? When you're just speaking about the number up in front and the letter that is immediately attached to it, all right? Coefficient variable. In a slightly different context, all right? An alternative name for this is in reference to its relationship as part of this, x and three, all right? In which case you would call it a base. You're already familiar with that, I'm sure. All right. It is the base, it is the slightly larger font, um, item, article, figure, drawing, character, all right, uh, of these two. Slightly larger and on the sort of regular tier, if you will, all right. The slightly smaller font and on a higher tier would be the numeral three here. This, in the same context of these two things considered in tandem, is that this is an exponent. All right. Do be clear about that. Again, if, if there's a, a cause for confusion, it's that, I'm flipping off my board here. If there's a cause for confusion, it's that we have a lot of words to describe the same thing, all right? But just realize that the reason that there's more than one phrase talking about the same thing is because it has, it's just deciding what its job is in that, in that situation. So 
Uh, these two things together, base and exponent. If you wanted to be very uh, nerdy, if you will, uh, talk about the uh, type of uh, um, drawing this perhaps would make, um, if it was part of an equation, this is referred to also as a degree, right? A degree two equation you'll hear talked about, a degree one linear is another way, saying a quadratic for squares, you know, degree two, right? Um, it's just a fancy way of referring to it. Right? The whole thing, all right, these two things in tandem are a power. I didn't put a space for this, but you have some experience with it already from section 4.2 and 4.3 at least. All right? It's a power of whatever the base is. So if it's a base, if it was base uh, x, it would be a power of x. All right? The third power of x. Number. Okay. Um, then there's this, taking these two things, well, these three things, in consideration at once, all right? This, if you want to be very, very precise, all right, would be referred to or classified as a monomial, all right? A monomial is a, a specific type of what you'll see in a moment, polynomial. You may notice that the heading on this handout is polynomial terminology. Um, this is the more precise phrase to refer to 2x cubed, or 2x to the third, whichever you prefer. Okay? But do know these, these phrases, all right? This is a coefficient, fancy way of saying number sitting in front. This is a variable, fancy way of saying a letter, all right? Um, in the context of exponents, it's a base. Right? The exponent itself, 3, is an exponent or a degree, if you want to be really geeky. All right? And this single chunk of math stuff for right now, because this is another phrase I'm alluding to in a moment, is a monomial. Okay? Then there's these things in tandem. All right? If you were to, if this was part of not just a freestanding chunk of math stuff, all right, but something that is apparently part of uh, a problem, if you will, right? an operation. I'm going to circle these just to sort of, because I scribbled a lot. If you're referring to these four chunks simultaneously as part of apparently some sort of uh, a sum, looks like an, an addition problem, the, the phrase that you would use to describe them is terms. Each one of these is a term. Anything separated by a plus or a minus in theory is a term. Okay? Now, that's going to be important later when you're actually performing the operation, whether you're actually adding or subtracting, because you can legally only add or subtract like terms. These two things that are in the middle here, 7x and 3x, are like terms. Like terms uh, fit two criteria. They're the same letter and they're the same degree. Right? Why does a person care? You can only add or subtract like terms. So you could sort of crunch numbers, if you will, and compress this together into something less complex. So um, realistically, it's just a matter of adding the 7 and the 3. You don't change the x's into x2. If you, if you feel that inclination, I, I'm with you. I, I totally get that. That's from multiplication. That's, that's something in the future, at least in the course of this conversation. These two things in tandem would be 10x. Right? And if you want to be fancy, you could put the 1 that is the exponent here, just to be very, very precise. If you've noticed that um, math people a lot of times will uh, put things in and leave things out, right, willy-nilly, right, um, it's just because it's not important, right, at the time that they're writing something, or maybe they're just absent-minded, right? When it comes to something like ones, they're optional, right? 
I find, I'm fond of saying this because I think it's true. Math people are notoriously lazy. Lazy is a meaner way of saying efficient, and efficient is a nicer way of saying lazy. <laughs> All right? When it's a convenience, they will leave out the ones. Okay? If it's a convenience, it's an optional thing. Ones, zeros, decimal points, positive signs, often these are things that are optional. You don't have to physically write them all of the time. Right? It's I, especially if I'm you know, teaching a person, will encourage you to be more precise than normal. Right? There's no sin in being perfectly precise 100% of the time. Right? Especially in math world. All right? It helps. All right? As with neatness as well. Anyhow, like terms are the same letter, these are both x's, the same degree, they're both ones. Beyond checking that they are these conditions, that they like terms, all you need to do to add or subtract is just add 7 and 3, so you would get 10 in that case. If you wanted to make this more concise. Okay? Right. Now, um, this thing hanging on the end here has a name too. All right? A number without a letter is referred to as a constant because it never changes. In this particular example, it's five fathom, all right? It's never going to be anything else, all right? Side note, all right? I don't want to drive you nuts, but if you do take calculus, and it is a worthy use of your time, all right, just realize that you will see something like the plain ordinary number five in calculus but the context will change a little bit. So what they will do is go, oh yeah, five isn't just five, and they'll say it's five x to the zero. All right. If you have done any of the work in section four two and four three, you know already that if you have um, a number to zero, that this is really just one, right? The only exception is zero as a base itself, right? But for the most part, it's, it's just uh, the outcome of this. If it was 2 to the 0, it's 1. If it's 3 to the 0, it's 1. If it's 10 to the 0, it's 1. All right? 5 times 1 is just 5. In the calculus, they have a tendency to actually bother to write that. You are not responsible for that. But keep it in the back of your head. All right? The one thing that you have to convince yourself is that when you're taking a class by me, somebody else, or maybe you're teaching it, all right? There are times when the context changes, right? And um, even though I think it would be better to over explain things, sometimes people don't, all right? So just don't get mad, just trust yourself that you're not seeing everything, all right, all of the time. Okay, here's the last thing. Um, <clears throat> this entire string of terms, 2x squared plus 7x1 plus 3x plus 5, all right, unnecessary chunk here, is in a more general way referred to as a polynomial. Remember what I had said before, all right? A monomial is a specific type. To use the word polynomial is to not be very precise. It's a generalization. Actually, when you have a four-term-wide polynomial, as you have in this case, there's no consensus on that. There's no name. Right? You may have heard of monos and binomials and trinomials. Beyond three terms, and this would be an example of having four, technically, all right, there's no quadrinomial. That would make total sense, granted, if that was the nomenclature, like bicycles have, is a quadricycle, you know, uh, if it has four wheels, you know, a tricycle has three wheels, a bicycle has two. All right, but math people have not formed a consensus on that, so they just they just generalize and go, ah, it's a polynomial, whatever. All right. Um, what's more important is the type, uh, rather the way that it's written. It's a polynomial in good etiquette, if you will, descending order. You could have a bunch of gobbledygook. You could have the five sitting up in front, the two x squared somewhere stuffed in the middle. And it would technically be the same polynomial, all right? And unless you have a real stickler for a teacher, all right, they really shouldn't take points off for it being sloppy, all right? But it's not good etiquette, all right? The, the best way I could describe it is that math people, even if they are lazy, even if they are efficient in their own way, for their own convenience, 
um, do conform to a sort of etiquette, the way something looks, not so much as a logic attached to it, right? To put things in descending order. That's referring to the exponents. They diminish, right? They start with the largest exponent to go down to the next lowest, and then and technically that's why I mentioned five. Five is technically x to the zero, right? We don't bother to write that, right? You can rearrange it and put it in ascending order, but descending is better, considered good etiquette, pinky in the air, sipping tea kind of thing, okay? Coffee is finally kicking in, yay. It's been very dragging all morning. My sister basically drank all the coffee and left. Right. And left me with no cream either. So I'm like, you scallywag. Alright, how am I gonna function if I don't have my wake up juice? rather quickly. Right. Now, now we got some terminology out of the way, let me give you an overview. All right. In the subject of algebra, algebra, there's two types of problems basically. Right. There are expressions and there are equations. I can't decide whether I want to write a script or not. All right. Script as somehow I didn't do that here. As expressions and equations. All right. Again, why would a person care? All right, to distinguish between one and the other because they actually follow slightly different sets of rules. So if a person and you got it again, if you're teaching children that are of the age of algebra, which would be like maybe sixth grade in the United States maybe um you have to teach them how to look at things right it's reading in its own sort of a way here are the characteristics right an expression is something that has numbers it has letters variables it has operations And equations have that too, all right? But they have one extra feature to distinguish them. And it's kind of, it's, it gives, uh, the, the clue is basically in the root of the word, equal, all right? Equations have an equal sign. Which makes it basically um, two sides. All right. Think about it this way: expressions are the building block. All right. Of math goodness, an algebraic expression will have probably a number and a letter, All right. minimally. All right. Um, a number or a letter. Minimally. Right, an operation. All right. An equation, if these expressions are the building block, equations are the building. They're made from that. Here's a way of looking at it as well. Sort of a model, if you will. Right. I'll put it here. Whatever interesting things, distinct things, unique to a problem, that you have gobbledygook written on this side of equals and on this side of equals. All right. Those things by themselves will be expressions. All right. 
the whole kit and caboodle is an equation. As I said, expressions are the building block, equations are the building. Right? They're the completed structure. All right? Again, you care because they will, in order to deal with one or the other, they have different sets of rules, which is a cause for confusion. People, if they don't distinguish between these, they may inadvertently use these rules when they should use those first. Okay. Um, here's some examples of expressions. Um, just an X sitting onto itself. Is that a little faint, perhaps? Use this. An X. An X plus 2. Um, 3 times the quantity. 2X plus 3. All right. 2x plus 1 sitting on top of 2x minus 3, and then something that looks like a trinomial, 7, pardon me, x squared plus 7x plus 3. Okay. Each one of these things is an algebraic expression. They have a letter, a number, and in some cases more than one operation. Right? Um, Anything that is algebraic most certainly has a letter in it. All right. Otherwise, you might call it a numerical expression, like the number two is a numerical expression. Right. Um, notice, though, no equal signs anywhere in here. All right. As soon as you see an equal sign, you're dealing with an equation. Right. It's made of these building blocks. So something like, just to give you an example of this as well, Something like 2x minus 3 equals 7. It has two opposing sides, if you will. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, um, I need the space. So I'm going to erase. I'm just going to erase this stuff here because I have to put some rules here. You do have a handout, actually. You have this at least two, uh, my own, and then that which I stole from the textbook, so I kind of liked it. Um, that describes the, the uh, process, the procedures of each. Right. Um, in a nutshell, all right, when you're dealing with expressions, you're gonna see instructions like this. It's gonna say, simplify. And then you will see, uh, sometimes else, they'll just refer to it as evaluate. Okay. When it comes to equations, the telltale um, instruction is really neither of those. I should blue with all writes very nicely, but erase which will be nicely. Um, the telltale instruction for equations is solve. Here's another example of where English gets you in trouble. All right? In vernacular conversation, ordinary run-of-the-mill conversation, you'll have a student at some point who will say to you, Hey, uh, teacher, <laughs> what do you want me to do here? It's uh, solve, you know? And they might be, um, you know, if it's an equation that they're given that's appropriate to use that phrase, all right? But when they present to you what they believe the instructions are, right, they may inadvertently use the wrong phrase. And in ordinary conversation, it's totally excusable. You shouldn't really, you know, berate them or anything like that. They're like, how, how dare you uh, not use uh, simplify when you were referring to solving or vice versa? You know, just make sure that when a kid asks you, Hey, uh, do you want me to simplify this equation? You go, yeah, I do. I, I want you to go through it because in their own mind, it's the same thing. All right, go, yes, but don't use that word, all right? Because, because solving is a specific set of procedures. All right, simplifying is less procedure, okay? So do forgive them for misuse of a phrase, you know? 
but uh, make sure that they realize that there are specific instructions. Simplify and, and solve are not really synonymous is what I'm getting at. Okay, what does it mean to solve? Uh, for our purposes, uh, it usually means combine like terms. As you are already aware, that means add or subtract. All right, things that have matching letters and degree. Okay. We're going to pay special attention to properties in a moment because if you wanted to be very technical, there are properties involved. Right. I don't think the name of the properties is important as um, the process that they're describing. Right. They're, it's more or less the, the legal ease of why you, you can combine things. Um, as for evaluating, evaluating in its own way is implying that you're dealing with just numbers. Right? Um, so you may start out with something algebraic, that there are letters, and then you substitute a value. All right. That usually means that you substitute first, All right. and then you're just dealing with just numbers. So if you're just dealing with numbers that may be added, multiplied, subtracted, in tandem somehow, All right. what you need to do is follow the, the agreed upon, the consensus of the order of operations. All right. You're going to use the order of operations which you probably have heard of, especially by this point in your life. The order of operations is PEMDAS. I've seen other versions of it as well. That's the acronym for the procedure of dealing with things in parentheses, dealing with exponents, dealing with multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction in a particular order. Um, there's an older mnemonic, a memory saving device, if you will, which I was taught, and I think it's better only for the reason that it's sort of a drawing that goes with it, all right? And it, it, it's meant to uh, circumvent the issue of maybe doing multiplication always when you really should consider multiplication and division on the same tier, they're on the same level of importance, all right? I'll, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Anyhow, just to summarize, if you evaluate, you're substituting some given number in place of a letter, all right? It means you're just dealing with numbers. And if you have several operations to deal with, you're going to crunch numbers by using the order of operations. Right? When you're simplifying, you're going to try to essentially combine like terms. Right? Maybe put things in descending order. I'll add that as well. Rewrite in descending order to be neat. Neatness helps. I know I'm not setting a very good example working on a board like this, but teach your students all right, um, and give them the tools, you know, graph paper, if necessary. Teach your students that when it comes to doing a calculation, neatness helps, right? Don't break them, don't make them feel bad, all right? But teach them, show them, all right, how to be neat, how to put things in order. It sounds crazy, right? And you want me to draw in little numbers and little boxes and things like that? Yeah, all right, because you will circumvent the mistake, all right? It sounds anal retentive. Right, I suppose it is, right? But if they give your kids paper like this to teach them how to make, you know, their, their letters, right? I want a world where we give kids graph paper and we put the, teach them to put the digits in the boxes, right? It helps, it's a skeleton. Um, I'm still building up an overview here. Uh, let's see. As for equations, th this is the procedure in a nutshell. You solve equations by essentially isolating the variable. What does that mean? It means get the letter alone on one side. Right. What does that usually look like? If you can imagine something looking like this, where you have a letter, the equal sign, and then a number, right? 
it's just those features. One letter sitting here, an equal sign, and just one number sitting here. Then you're done, all right? That's solved, all right? That's the ideal situation. Does it always work out that way? No, all right, unfortunately. But this is the goal. Isolate the letter, get it alone on one side. Does it matter if it's on the left or the right? No, and again, you shouldn't get, give a kid a hard time and say, I'm gonna put it on the right side, all right? It helps as a person who is, you know, conditioned to think linearly, right? We, we live in the Western world here, right? That uh, you put the letter here and the number there, but there is no sin really, right? And having it switched like that, okay? Right. How do you isolate the letter? How do you isolate the variable? All right. Um, as sort of a preliminary step, which is why I'm labeling it zero, you basically try to simplify first. You're going to attempt, it doesn't always have to happen, attempt to simplify, combine like terms, use properties if necessary, each side of equals first. That is to say, independent of each other. Right? If when you start out, you don't have to do that, you only know by looking, then you could really do what is the, the sort of the, the mainstay of this process. All right? You essentially are going to perform opposite operations. Opposite, which this is, a, if there's again a reason why a kid resists this because it, it, you know, you just got done telling me that that means Ed. All right, imagine, remember back when you were a kid, maybe junior high, middle school, when you were first learning how to go, maybe in middle school, all right? And you, 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 somebody said to you, I want you to subtract <laughs> when you saw that symbol. You'd be like, you just spent, you know, six years at least, you know, before this telling me that this means Ed. Because, all right, when you solve an algebraic equation, it's a technique that you're learning. It's a balancing act, right? And everything, this is a phrase that I'm fond of saying as well, everything is going to be okay in the end, all right? As long as you're consistent, all right? Here's a more concise way of saying that. You can get away with murder in math, all right? as long as you're consistent. If you start doing weird stuff, all right, to one side of an equal sign, just make sure that you do the same weird stuff to the opposite side of an equal sign and everything is super great, all right? It's a balancing act, all right? Anyhow, you do opposite operations when you're solving an equation, which means if you see a plus, if you want to justify moving something, you subtract. If you see a multiplication, you do the opposite of multiplication, which is division. And then to make it legal, you do it to both sides. Okay? The order of operations is pretty much straightforward. If you see adding, you add. If you multiply, you multiply. There are some weird conditions where maybe if you're dealing with fractions, Right? You end up doing, like for instance, if you're dividing fractions, you end up multiplying by a reciprocal. That's for some other principle that predates all of this conversation. But it's pretty much, there's no guessing. If you see adding, you add. If you see multiplying, you multiply. You do the operation as they are given to you. Right? That's evaluating right, an algebraic expression. That's if you're sticking with just one side. When you are trying to do this stuff, right, with the goal of isolating the, uh, the variable, the letter, you are moving things around. You're moving letters and numbers around. Over the equal sign. In order to justify moving something over an equal sign, you do opposite operations, right? That's the technique that you have to sort of ingrain into your mind and into your students' minds. It's a balancing act. Okay, a little counterintuitive, all right? But the more you do it, the better you get at it, as with anything. Okay, let me spritz this here. And now 
nozzle is getting sticky here. Um, here's those properties that I was only vaguely referring to. All right, they're good to know by name. All right, just to distinguish one from another. All right, um, at least two of them mean the same thing. They look different, but they basically mean the same thing. I'm going to give it to you as I was taught in third grade, sixth grade, ninth grade, twelfth grade. All right, and then I'm going to tell you something a better way to think about it. All right, all right. these are good properties to know. There is first and foremost the commutative property. Commutative. Tative. Right? Not commutative. All right. Commutative. All right. There's a commutative property of addition or multiplication. Right? There isn't one for subtraction. It wouldn't work if you tested it. And there isn't one for division. Just multiplication or just adding exclusively. What does that look like? <clears throat> They give you models often in a textbook that involve letters. So you would see something like this. A times B equals B times A. And I'll just do the same thing. A plus B equals B plus A. Okay. Let me get the other one that gets, comes up a lot. The associative property. And there is similarly only an associative property, or to say, there is an associative property of addition, or there is one of multiplication. There is not an associative property of subtraction. There is not an associative property of division. If you tested those things, they would not work. Okay. Right, how does that look? Um, it usually involves three figures in the model. So you see something like this an equal sign in between, and sexual multiplication first, okay. When things are associative, they are being grouped somehow. So you'll see a parentheses often in the model. And then what shifts is just the parentheses itself, usually. The contents of the parentheses on either side of equals will bear one thing in common, at least. All right. So, in this case, you're associating these two things as being the most important. Your attention is drawn to the things that are encapsulated. Or, you are drawing your attention to these two things specifically, meaning that they're the most important thing to deal with. All right. And similarly, B, C. Plus, plus, plus. Group, 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 slightly different. Okay. Now... That's the way that you would see it in any textbook, right? And I myself was taught this in at least third grade, you know, um, maybe fourth. And then again in sixth grade, and then probably in eighth grade, and then in ninth grade, and then in twelfth grade. And every year, my teacher, a good person that they were, they would say, hey, listen, kid, you better get this down, write this down. But I just didn't absorb the message, right? Here's the message that I learned later in life, shamedly. Basically what these two things are saying, in their own unique ways, right, is that order in which you add or the order in which you multiply doesn't matter. That's not a very eloquent way of speaking, but it does get at the heart of the matter. All right. In other words, you could have the two written in the front, 
all right, and the three written after it. Or you could switch their position and put the three in the front and the two after it. But as long as you're just multiplying, you're going to get the same answer. It doesn't matter what the arrangement is, all right? Same thing with adding. Same thing with the associative property. Yes, they distinguish these two because this involves three things in tandem or in, in unison, all right, and parentheses to distinguish it, all right? But it's the same basic idea. The order in which you add doesn't matter, right? So the real power here is this. That means that you have the, the authority, the artistic license to do things in any order that you feel comfortable, all right? There's been some backlash in the past few years, especially with the, um, uh, what was it, the, uh, I don't teach in grammar school anymore, but uh, um, the testing, right, in the, in the state of New Jersey. They say that we have these, these goofy haywire ways of, of teaching kids how to add and multiply, whatever, and that's true. They're not the most efficient necessarily, but I, I would guess that the reason for teaching people to do something kind of unusual like maybe add in a strange arrangement or multiply in a strange arrangement, is because they're trying to teach this idea that you have the freedom to decide, at least as an adult, all right, what, what's the most convenient way of multiplying for your own sake, right? Or what's the, most, the more convenient way to add for your own sake, right? It's the flexibility of mind that we're trying to teach people, right? There's more, often is the case in math, there's more than one way to do something. Right. Yes, with enough experience, you will say you will decide for yourself. You go well. There may be several ways, but this is the fastest way, right. versus some other way. But you'll only know having tried. All right. So anyway, keep a, keep an open mind. All right. The goal here is also mental flexibility. Right. Here's the last of three that are very good to know. The distributive property. Now, technically, there are two incarnations of this, right? They will, in a textbook, some textbooks, maybe not. I don't think ours did. Um, they would say, they would call it the distributed property of multiplication, because that's what it is, really. Over addition, or perhaps over subtraction. How does that look? Well, as a model, it basically is, I use these same letters. I'll use green just to distinguish it, but I hope it's visible. Um, a situation like this, where you have a parenthesis, which is basically drawn to, to, to focus on the contents. It's to get the person's attention when you see parentheses. It's just to say, these two things are the most important things. Lock your, your, your eyes on that. If you can't combine the contents, of the parentheses, because maybe they're not like terms, even if they happen to be sitting next to each other. Then the alternative, one way to get around this, right, is to distribute, right? What does that mean? It means via the process of multiplication, give the outside content to each of the inside count contents via multiplication, which means that you would end up with something that looks like this as a generalization. A, B, my green is fading out, and A, C. Now, if we were just dealing with numbers, all right, it, wouldn't, it would be superfluous. You wouldn't even have to do this. But if you have something that is even slightly algebraic, meaning that maybe one of these things is an actual letter, an actual variable, like X, all right, sometimes that's the best that you can do. You could just dismiss the parentheses by doing the multiplication. All right, here's another one. I wish my green wasn't so lousy. That one's better. Okay. Put that one over there. All right. Um, suppose you had this, just uh, if you have the subtraction incarnation of this. Two contents of parentheses that if they're just numbers, yes, indeed, you can do the subtraction first and then do multiplication last because of the parentheses is specifying that. Right. It's not really defying the order of operations. Right. It's just under the circumstances where you can't actually merge these two things. They're not like terms, perhaps. 
then what you could get away with doing, according to the distributive property, is multiply the outside by each of the insides. Right? And in which case, again, you would have something very similar. You'd have these things, like so. Okay? It's kind of a back door, if you will. before I get to the examples. That's why it's taking so long. I apologize. It doesn't help that I have to erase everything. Who would mind to get this wet? Maybe that will make my life a little bit better. So, no, that's a bad idea. Okay. separate colors doesn't write it well. Um, um, at least it erases very easily. That's the benefit of using chalk. All right, now finally some examples. Oh wait, uh, one other thing. Here's the order of operations. This will be important. So I'll put it over here for reference. There is famously PEMDAS, or some other acronym. And if that's what you were taught, that's cool, right? It's an acronym where the initials represent the operations, right? the procedure to deal with them. I, I still would like to impart to you uh, uh, some wisdom that was given to me a long time ago, so I'll do that now. There is this mnemonic device, please. Excuse my dear Aunt Sally. All right, and it accomplishes the same thing. If P is referring to the parentheses, then that's what please does, right? That's what must be done first, right? You see a parentheses, zero in on that. Whatever gobbledygook is on the inside, just deal with it. Right? Excuse is when you have something that is raised to an exponent, or in theory, if you have something like a square root. And that's something that you generally deal with second. Um, my idea is multiplication and division. And you deal with those things third. This is the reason why I mention this now. I have found that students that are familiar with PEMDAS make one innocent mistake. They go, well, the M shows up before the D, therefore multiplication is always before division. But that's not true. All right. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally is arguably a better mnemonic device because, at least the way that I've, I've been taught, is to sort of write these things on tiers. All right. Multiplication and division, yes, my is in front of dear, right? and they represent those two operations respectively. They're on the same level. Right? They're equally important. They're opposite operations, therefore these are equally important. Right? Which means that you do whichever is further left. A similar situation would arise if you had two different sets of parentheses that were separated by plus, you know, maybe in between them. Right? You do the one on the left technically first. Okay? Uh, similarly, right, Aunt Sally right, is addition and subtraction. 
you do these things last, generally. All right? They are also equally important, and that is signified by the fact that they are on the same level. All right? They are opposite operations. They are not one is more important than the other. They are equal and opposite, if you will. Sort of male and female, if you will. All right. Okay. Anyhow, um, there are some technicalities where you have to, when you deal with fractions or things that are more appropriately referred to as rational expressions. Uh, let me give you one little added thought here. All right. um, if you have a problem that is stacked like this, and I'm just kind of emphasizing that there's a line in between them. It's a glorified fraction, otherwise known as a rational expression would be a better way of saying it probably. In a case like that, uh, this line really is division. So you might go, well, I must end up doing the division before I start adding anything up here or subtracting anything down here per se. But you can't because of the nature of fractions. So this is the one sort of technicality that you have to kind of bear in mind. All right. When you have a situation like this, you're going to simplify each independently first, right? By doing what you have to. What's up here, you deal with, you crunch it down to one number, if you can help it. Whatever you have down here, you deal with it, you crunch it down to one number. You simplify each of those things independently, and then you will, because of maybe the, these things are divisible, right? you divide the top by the bottom last. Right. So just remember that. All right, that's out of the frame. Sorry. You divide the top, whatever you've crunched it down to, by the bottom, whatever you've crunched it down to, last. All right, that's the one technicality. These are equally important. Okay. To whichever is on the left. Okay. All right. Now, finally, some examples. Yeah. If you had something like this, where well, you see three x plus six x, right? Let me just say one thing up front. There is a an implied instruction here, right? and if you don't know it, it's okay. Right? But with enough experience, you go, I know what to do without sort of automatically. You don't even need to read the instructions. I'm setting a bad example. You know, nobody will ever tell you, right? Never, never have you heard a teacher go, never read the instructions, right? That's terrible, right? But there is, it, it is good to cultivate intuition about something. So in the in the totally nonverbal way, right, you could figure out what has to be accomplished here. Right? And that is this. That you have to simplify. Right? How come? Because there's no equal sign here. Which means that and they're not just purely numbers, they're they're algebraic expressions. And yes they are in fact like terms. So a sort of in your mind, the, 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 the thought process is basically this. Every time you're going to ask yourself, am I dealing with an expression or am I dealing with an equation? All right? You don't see an equal sign, you're dealing with an expression. Which means that, okay, I'm either going to simplify or I'm going to evaluate. Evaluating means that you're going to substitute some given value. That is, you're going to plug a number into a letter. There's no extra information here, so it can't be that in this case. What you would end up having to do is simplify. How so? All right. You're going to combine like terms. Legally speaking, how do you combine like terms? They have to have the same letter 
and they must be the same degree. Bolt squared, bolts, bolts of the first, which in this case they're not written, right? they don't have to be, right? And that just means add or subtract the coefficients, okay? So you probably knew already without me going through this process, but if, you have, if you're still uncomfortable and you're feeling around in the dark, just realize that there is in fact a strategy to this. Right? There is something that with enough time, enough effort, enough practice, you start to have an intuition. Right? If you have an intuition already, don't resist it. It's a blessing. Right? And don't talk a kid out of it either. What's just three plus six? Nine X. Suppose you had a more complicated problem. Let's see, I'm going to write this as uh, minus 3x plus 2 minus 5y plus 10 plus 2y plus 4x. Right. Now, again, no sign of an equals here, so you really have to simplify. There's nothing telling you that x is equal to some specific number. There's nothing telling you that there's some uh, y value that you're going to substitute. So the best that you could do is take this long, complicated thing and make it less ugly. Make it less long. Shorten it. All right. Here's what I do personally. I drop my marker on the floor. seriousness. You know that you have to combine the like terms, so draw yourself little a sort of uh, cues. Yeah. Associate the things that you're going to combine. All right. This is a like term with this. These two things will be merged. All right. Notice that I incorporated the sign that is immediately next to it. All right. This has a minus 3 here, and this has a plus 4 here. Okay. So if you do the arithmetic, right, one of each sign actually dictates that you subtract, right? So you would technically get one, and that's just one X. You don't have to write the one if you don't want to. As for the sign, you'll take the sign of the larger thing, right? So if it's a positive, it technically would be plus one X. The larger magnitude number technically is what the outcome will be here. We take it for granted, and I don't think we should, right, that you're comfortable with integers. Right? You do have a calculator, and the calculator could confirm or deny any suspicion you may have. But in the long run, it would be good also to memorize rules for integers. All right. Maybe I'll put that here just for reference. I don't like leaving out information. The prerequisite um, assignment that's in Canvas in my lab, it actually, it's basically that, all right? It's, it's testing, I can tell from doing it, that it's testing to see how well do you know your integer combinations, all right? Um, I'll put it here. There are rules for adding and subtracting, and there are rules for multiplying and dividing integers. And in a nutshell, you can think about it like this. If you have the same signs, then you add. If you have one of each, then you subtract. It's the combination that dictates the operation, right? Sign of the answer. Matches the larger magnitude. Magnitude is a technical term 
It's referring to the digit, really, the size of the number. I can't say greater or less than, because that would not be technically true. I am obligated to say the word magnitude. But essentially, if you think of something as being bigger, and it happens to be positive, then your answer is going to be positive. All right? If it was the negative that happened to be a larger magnitude, then the answer here would be negative. All right? Same signs, add one of each, subtract. The multiplication and division um, is a similar rule here. If you have the same signs, it doesn't dictate the operation. It just means that you have a positive answer. Versus if you have one of each, that means that you have a negative answer. For the most part, if it says multiply, you're going to multiply. If it says divide, you're going to divide. It doesn't change the operation. That's the difference between these. Right? The combination of signs, the adding and subtracting, dictate the operation. They do not dictate the operation when you're multiplying or dividing. All right, now to complete this thought. Circle the other like terms, in this case that happen to be y's, and you're going to merge those next. Negative 5y and 2y. They like terms because they're both y's and they both degree 1. Right? One of each means you're going to subtract. That gives you a numeral of 3. The sign of the 3 will be negative because it matches the larger magnitude. And then you just attach a y to it. Last. Um, you have these two here, that would be just regular constants, uh, 2 and 10. They're the same signs, they're both positive. All right, so you're just going to add them. It's going to be 12, so it's plus 12. All right. And this is your answer. The most concise way to write it is arguably the best. So without the unnecessary information, you don't have to put a positive, it's optional at the front. You don't have to put a coefficient of one, it's optional. Just like the degrees of one, you don't have to write. This would be the most concise way of writing this. If you wrote it that way, it's cool. If you write it this way, it's fancier. Okay. Next. something like this you could probably guess what the instruction is and that's not a bad thing to have intuition it's just that you know do check All right if you saw an algebraic expression there's a comma here negative x squared plus 3x plus 10 comma and then x plus 2 this is an example of a problem where you would have to evaluate right? which basically means substitute And then use the order of operations. This stuff. All right. What I would encourage you to do, and I, I would also encourage you to impart this to your students. All right. Draw little parentheses around the letters. A little pocket that you're going to insert what the value is. All right. The reason that I do that personally is to circumvent uh, problems with exponents and signs. If this thing itself did not come preordained as being having a parentheses, um, then put one just around the letter, not including the negative. That means that the only thing that is being affected here is whatever x is by this 2, not the sign. Okay? So, if this is what x is, you would put a 2 here and a 2 here. And it's a multi-operational problem. So you're going to have to follow the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Well, I purposely put parentheses, so yeah, I would sort of lock my focus on that anyway. But if there's only one content 
on the inside of the parentheses, there really isn't much you can do with it. I mean, if it was several things, uh, 2 plus 5 or whatever on the inside here, and it's not the case, then you would do that first. So, parentheses is fine, we verified. It's exponents that we would do next, all right, rather than ordinary multiplication. If you want to think about it this way, multiplying is an amped up form of, a, of, of multiplication, pardon me. Multiplication is a more sophisticated form of adding, all right. It's adding quickly from some information that's memorized. Exponents is an amped up version, a more sophisticated version of multiplying. It's a more specific type, all right, as well. All right, one is derived from the other, that's what I'm getting at. Two squared is just four. There's still this negative sitting here. There's all this other junk that follows it. Some people, they make mistakes when they're doing multi-operational problems for such a silly reason, right? Because somebody in their life said, you have to do this in your head, all right? That's really the stupidest thing anybody ever told you. I'm sorry to say it, all right? If you were a kid and you went through school, and maybe the reason you hate math, is because somebody said to you, hey, how come you're doing this in your head first? And I'll frick that, all right? Erase that conditioning. Etch a sketch. Forget that you were told that, all right? What's better than doing something in your head is writing what's going on, all right? As it slowly evolves, all right? Why? Because nobody is psychic, really. If you write what you are thinking, then people can see your thoughts. And then they can help, and you can catch your own mistakes. I do all the time. I make mistakes all the time, all right? But because I wrote what my thought process was, all right, I see where I made the error. So encourage students to do that. Write what you are thinking. Sorry to make a speech. All right. So we're creating this algorithm of thought process, the step-by-step -step process that we're crunching numbers. We may take something only long and complicated and narrowing it down to one figure. This is how programming works, all right? You now have a regular ordinary four, what appears to be multiplication of these two things, and then add addition of 10. What's the next most important thing after exponents? Regular ordinary multiplication. So what must you do? You must do these two things, all right? Multiply. That means that you have six here, all right? There's no negatives involved in these two things, so it's just six, and you could say it's plus, all right? Rewrite minus four that's adjacent and plus 10, okay? Now, you've gotten it down to basically operations that are on the same tier, addition and subtraction. We're gonna do that last. Which of these should you appropriately do first? Well, since adding and subtracting are equally important, you're going to do the things that are on the far left first. So therefore, it is negative four plus six. They're one of each sign, so you're really going to subtract. And that will give you a numeral of two. And the sign of this two is going to match the bigger magnitude, which in this case would technically be a positive. Then there's this leftover 10 here. All right, last thing is just to add these two, right? Two plus 10 is 12. Okay. All right. I'm going to erase this because I, I do need the space. You have the reference in theory already. And then we'll go a little bit faster. Here's another diagram to uh, summarize some information. All right, we're getting into solving now. Solving equations. All right. Now, bear in mind, what's the answer? All right. We say that a lot, a lot. And when we get an answer, we give an answer. We assume mistakenly 
that it's correct. All right. But truth be told, all right, answers to a problem can fall under one of two headings. They can either be true or they can be false. All right. Especially in math world, right? You can get situations where you do everything right, right? Your arithmetic is flawless, your algebra is well balanced, and then in the end you get a false answer, and it's not your fault, all right? So don't, you know, um, um, don't reproach yourself, all right, too harshly, or know the people who do your teaching, all right? It's just something that naturally arises. There are situations where you do everything right and you still get a false answer, all right? It's the true answers, in particular, the things that are good answers versus bad answers that are referred to as solutions. What is a solution to an algebraic equation? An answer that's true. All right. What is not a solution to an algebraic equation? Something that's a false answer when you test it. Okay. So, um, what you should do is a good habit, and I'm going to neglect to do that because I'm a bad seat, I guess. All right? Is that sometimes you will do your work and then you will get it down to more or less the ideal situation. You go letter equals number. All right? That's what we're brainwashed, we're conditioned to look for. Just one letter is equal to just one number. Good. What you should do as a good habit is you should check. Check the answer. How so? You plug into the original equation to see if it balances. In other words, if you end up with the same answer on opposite sides of equals after you've substituted this value in place of x, right, then it is in fact true. It's a way of certifying. Okay. Um, if you get something bogus, it could just mean that um, it's extraneous. There's a fancy way of saying uh, an answer that uh, doesn't work. Okay. Now, um, as for the techniques, they're not so easy to lose things, butterfingers. Here are the techniques, basic techniques. There's four. I'll draw a little T shaped diagram here. Okay. There's um, yeah, technically properties. One would call an addition property. I don't think the names are so important as the ideas behind them. The sub, sub, subtraction property. The multiplication property. And the division property. Okay. Um, Basically, the addition property is to add to both sides. That's all that it means. Of equals. Right? Similarly, the subtraction property would be to subtract both sides. And the multiplication property would be the same thing. Multiply both sides. And the division property would be to divide both sides by the same quantity. These are collectively referred to as one-step equations, what you're going to see as examples. It's getting a little too dark to see that. Perhaps that might be a little bit better. Uh, so here are some examples. Um, x minus 8 is equal to 12. And then there's this one, x plus 11 is equal to 19. And x over 4 is equal to 8. And 7x is equal to 35. 
This is a one-step algebraic equation. This is a one-step algebraic equation. As is this, as is this. Why do they call it that? Because they only involve one operation. If you have more than one, they might call it a two-step or multi-step. Right? But these involve just one thing each. Now, here's where I want to corrupt you in a good way. All right? One of the handouts that I have is something I made a while ago. When I do these personally, I draw a little table every time. So you could use this as sort of scaffolding if you want. If you, if you, uh, some textbooks sort of encourage you to sort of write things out more horizontally. I tend to do them more vertically. I think it's more neat, um, and I think it makes it neatness helps and I get to the answer. It's good to have the flexibility of mind to be able to write something more than one way. But humor me. Here's what you'll see. All right, draw a little table. All right. If the whole thing, if the whole concept, the basic idea of algebra is that it is a balancing act, drawing this table and having this sort of fulcrum here, all right, emphasizes that characteristic. All right? If you're going to isolate the variable x, then therefore you're going to have to move things that are not x away from it. When you're moving over equals, as in this case, how do you do it? By doing opposite operations. What is the opposite of subtraction? Adding. Right. So you are going to add 8 to both sides. Remember what I said before, you can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent. Right. If I start adding 8 here, seemingly for no reason, then I, it's totally cool as long as I do it to the opposite side. It balances it. Right. Anyhow, something combined with this exact opposite self right, via addition subtraction cancels. That amount would be zero. You do not have to write the zero here. The whole point of this is to get it to the ideal situation where it's just the letter equals just some number. All right, what's 12 plus eight? 20. And that's your answer, x is equal to 20. Right. Similarly, for a little table like this, all right? The goal here is to get x by itself, isolate the variable. How do we do that? Move things away from it. We do the opposite of adding, which is subtraction. Minus 11, minus 11. Something combined with its exact opposite self, right, by addition subtraction operation, cancels. All right? You do not have to put the zero here. It's not hurting it if you do, all right? but it would be superfluous. It's unnecessary. All right? What's left over is the letter, equal sign, and then you do the arithmetic here. This is a positive 19 and a negative 11, if you will. One of each sign, you actually subtract, you get 8. Takes the sign of the bigger thing, magnitude. So this would be x equals 8. This is something that is going to involve multiplication in order to justify moving the 4 from here to there. Over equals, you do opposite operations. This bar means divide. In our division, we have the traditional division symbol. We have sort of that little division box. And then we have the bar, where there's a top and a bottom. Well, that's the, the in math, uh, pardon me, in algebra, the preference is to use something in this sort of rational style of division rather than the more traditional symbol. Just be aware. Right. Anyhow, the opposite of dividing by four is to multiply by four. You can put the x, so I'm gonna use a dot. All right, do it here, do it there, all right? If something is being multiplied that is also divided by the same number, these are opposite operations. This is dividing by four, this is multiplying by four. Essentially, these cancel, all right? And that leaves you with just the thing you're looking for, which is x. Then you just do the multiplication here. Eight times four is 32, all right? And that's your answer. One more of these. When you see um, a coefficient and a variable butted up against one another, what operation is implied by that? Right? They don't use a symbol, they just press the two things together. It's implied that they're multiplied. Right? So maybe to make, draw some emphasis, make it obvious, put a dot there. Right? Anyhow, how do we go about the process of solving this? Well, we've got to get x alone, so we have to move things away from it. 
The opposite of multiplying by 7 is to divide by 7. Again, in, in algebra, the preference to imply division is to use this ball. So you're going to divide by 7 here, and similarly divide by 7 here. 7 divided by 7, a number divided by itself, largely, the only exception is 0, is what? It's 1. They cancel, just like these cancel. And those cancel, and those cancel. The difference between the cancellation here and the cancellation here is that these cancellations produce zeros, and these cancellations produce one. Right? Neither of those do you have to write. It would be more concise, a better answer for presentation purposes to not write that. Is it a sin to put 1x? No. But it would be more concise to simply put x. Anyhow, what's 35 divided by 7? Okay, those basic four techniques, right, you will see a lot and sometimes in tandem with each other. Okay, this is the name of them. They addition property, subtraction property, multiplication property, division property. What's more important than that is this basic idea. If you want to move something over equals, you perform opposite operations. So if you see plus, subtract. If you see minus, add. You see division, you multiply. You see multiplication, you divide. Okay? Two-step. My poor grandfather they used that. He used to trip a lot. Um, it was sort of, um, I think, um, what's the phrase? Um, congenital? Is that it? something like that? A genetic disease. Um, where he would sometimes, as an old man, at least, he used to sometimes lose a balance. So he would catch himself and we would pull it. Ah, he did the two-step. All right. Thankfully, he never fell. Um, he was a good guy. Anyhow, we're going to solve what will be a two-step equation now. So if you see this, 3x minus 5 is equal to 28. Again, if you, have, if you feel comfortable, if you have a system for getting through this, which is intuitive to you and comfortable, good. All right, that is a blessing, and you should never talk a kid out of their intuition when it comes to math. All right, it, it truly is a blessing. But do keep an open mind. All right, uh, so I will just walk you through the process as I would do it. Okay, remember the goal here is you want a situation ultimately that looks like this. You want it to just be letter equals number. And if it's not that way, you're going to try to perform some operations in order to get that way. All right. Now, here's where it, uh, um, this is to distinguish it from uh, order of operations as well. If you have an equation, you know that you do opposite operations to move things around. Which of them should you do first? The order of operations. And that's four expressions. It says you do multiplication or division before addition or subtraction. That's for expressions. When you're dealing with equations, you do opposite operations, All right. which usually means this backwards, basically. You're going to do adding or subtracting first, all right? And then multiplication or division second. It's exactly the opposite of what you would do normally. That's for equations, okay? So, more or less, you do the easy part first, the adding and subtracting part. Here's a little table. We will move the five first, because it's going to involve maybe adding, maybe subtracting. How do I justify moving it? The opposite of subtraction is to add. If I did it here, I'm obligated, my hands are tied, 
I must do it here. Right. You can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent this way. Right. It's a balancing act. What is something combined with its exact opposite sign cell by addition subtraction? They cancel. You could put a zero here if you like. Um, right what's left over. There's a 3x here. Then you do this computation here. 28 plus 5 is what? 33. Okay. That's the first step. Now we do the second step because there's a second operation. We did the addition subtraction first because we're dealing with an equation. And now we're going to do the multiplication and division second. If these things are pressed together, we understand that there's multiplication really going on in between these two. To justify now moving this 3 from here to here with the goal of getting it letter equals number exclusively, we do the opposite of multiplying by 3, which is to divide by 3. And if I did that here, I got to do it here. 3 divided by itself cancels. It would technically be 1. You don't have to write that. And now you have x left over equals, perform the arithmetic. 33 divided by 3 is 11. Okay. Looking T, I swear, plus three, 11 equals um, 2 times the quantity T plus 6 equals uh, minus 5, rather. I'm getting tongue tied. Okay. All right. Now, this is something that has a lot of preliminary prep work. That's a redundancy. There's a lot of prep work to this, right? Remember what I had told you before, all right? Um, you may have to simplify the sides independently of each other first, all right? Um, the ideal situation is that you will have this to begin with. You'll have letter plus or minus number equals number. If you don't have that, if you have something more complicated than that, then what you will do is simplify first, if necessary, independently. In other words, don't start dragging things over here. Don't go using opposite operations yet. Just clean this up. Crunch it to, you know, this at worst, a letter sitting next to another. If you notice, there's parentheses here. So um, our focus should naturally be zeroing in on that. And when you observe the insides, you see you've got a letter and you got a number. All right? And they're just being added. So they're not like terms. The best that you can do in a situation to tidy this up is basically employ the distributed property, which is if I can't combine these two things, then maybe I could just make the parentheses go away. So, 2 times t compressed together is just 2t. Two, 2 times 6 is just 12. That's a positive. Meanwhile, there is this minus 5 still sitting here. And there's this junk still sitting here as well. Okay. We're still not going to perform the algebra yet. We're still doing arithmetic, basically. We're simplifying. We're going to try to get it down to letter plus or minus a number equals a number. And if we can't get it that way, then at least get it down to this. A letter plus or minus a number. Before I start doing algebra. All right. 
So the last thing on this side to tidy up is just clean up these two. Um, 2T is onto itself. That's the letter portion of this. Right. These are one of each side of integers, so I'm going to really subtract them. And I'm going to get a digit of 7 as a consequence. The sign of the 7 will be positive because of the larger magnitude, positive 12 here. There is nonetheless still the 6T sitting here, and this plus 11. Okay, now I've crunched this side, I've done the simplifying to the extent that I can. Now what I will do is employ opposite operations. The good news is that moving stuff around uh, works whether the term is just a regular ordinary number or the term is something that has a, a letter attached to it. So don't feel uh, intimidated. Right? You could move this chunk, this term 2T, a whole kit and caboodle, both pieces at once, if you want to, over to here. Right? And you can similarly br bring this 11 over here, as long as you perform the correct operation. Now remember, in order to accomplish that, to take a term, right, rather than just taking a coefficient, like two, is just adding or subtracting. So, let me get this out of the way. You can do this on two lines, or you can do it all on one line. What is, I'll move the T, uh, the two T first. I would prefer, just the personal idiosyncrasy, to like to keep the letters all on the left. Right? It's not wrong to pull the six over here. All right? You'll just have to deal with a, a, a different sign, maybe. What is the sign of something if it's not written? What do you assume it is? You will always assume that a sign that is not written is positive. So if you want to justify taking this entire chunk 2t, the whole term, not just the two, but both pieces simultaneously. Perform the opposite operation. The opposite of positive is minus 2t. And then, very strategically, park it underneath the thing that it most closely resembles. It's like term would be 16. All right. Something minus itself, even if I don't know what it is yet, and I don't technically, because the whole objective here is to find out what t is, it's still by sheer logic alone going to cancel out of existence. If I want to, just for the sake of for space, do this on uh, move the 11 now, you can, all right? But if you don't feel comfortable, I'll do it in two steps. This would have been zero, and that would have been seven. And this is still 11 sitting here. These are like terms. Six minus two is just four T, okay? This is superfluous. Now I have to basically continue in this process. If I've gotten letters exclusively on the left, just again, as a matter of preference, I like the left for letters. Now my hands are tied. Now I'm obligated to put numbers without letters over here on the right. Opposite of adding 11 is subtracting 11. So I'm going to just park it underneath the thing it most closely resembles, which is the, the, the constant 7, and talk myself into the process. Something minus itself cancels out of existence. What's left over? 4t. One of each sign, you subtract them. That establishes the digit. You subtract 11 and 7, you're definitely going to get 4. Right? What's the sign going to be? Matches the bigger one, so it's a negative. Last thing, move the 4 from here to here. The opposite of multiplying by 4 is dividing by 4. If you did it here, if you're obligated, do it to there. The fours will cancel, and it's just one, technically. What is the answer? T is equal to the outcome here. It is a negative four divided by a positive four. All right? When you're following the multiplication division set of rules for integer combination, one of each is not changing the operation. It's just saying that you're going to get a negative answer. All right? Four divided by four is one. T is equal to negative one. Don't be afraid to write your thoughts. This is how people can read your mind. Okay.
would like to be psychic. It occurred to me. And maybe that is possible, but I've not seen it yet. I don't like to be a closed-minded person, even if it is superstitious, I suppose. Um, be skeptical. As long as we're living in this plane of existence, we have to be skeptical. Okay. All right. So, all right. Uh, let me show you a shortcut or two. All right. These are special shortcuts. You don't have to do this. You can always do something brute force, as long as it's following the same sort of process. Opposite operations, balancing, cleaning up where you have to. All right. When you're dealing with fractions, and when you're dealing with decimals, in each of these cases, what you would be doing is creating equivalent Equations. What does that mean? It means they're not going to look like the equation that was given to you, but it will produce the same answer as if you just did it brute force. Right? You're going to basically change the appearance. Right? You're just changing the look. Why? Because it might be easier to deal with it when it's less ugly, less complicated looking. There are problems that have fractions, and there are problems that have decimals. And these are two shortcuts that you have an option to do with this one. So, um, the process of creating an equivalent equation when you're given fractions is to basically eliminate the denominators. This does assume that a person is fairly comfortable with fractions to begin with. Um, how does one eliminate denominators? You basically are going to multiply by taking the equation and multiplying the whole thing times the lowest common denominator. As long as you consistently multiply the entire equation, both sides of it, by the lowest common denominator, there'll be a cancellation effect. Right. Determining um, the lowest common denominator is mm, arguably sometimes not so easy. Right. Just remember, a lowest common denominator is the least common multiple of denominators. What does that mean? Well, there's factors and then there's multiples. And we're interested in the multiples really. Factors of 12 are things that make 12. 1 times 12, 2 times 6, 3 times 4 in tandem. Multiples of 12 are like counting by 12. So like 12, 24, 36, 48, and so forth. Right. Um, in a nutshell, factors, which is what these are, make products like 12. Multiples are products themselves. 12 times 1, 12 times 2, 12 times 3, 12 times 4. Right? This is an infinite list of factors of finite. All right. Anyhow, we're interested in multiples because that's what an LCD is. It's the lowest common denominator is the least common multiple of denominators. Okay. Here's an example. If you have a problem like this, um, try to fit myself in here. Two thirds x plus one third is equal to three fourths. Okay. Basically, stare at the denominators. Look 
at the moms. I'll circle them to emphasize here. They are three and four, basically. All right. Multiples, you could accomplish a common multiple by counting by threes or counting by fours. Right. So it would be like multiples of three and multiples of four. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, it goes on forever and ever. There is more sophisticated methods for acquiring this, but it would work if you did it brute force this way. Four, twelve, pardon me, eight. 12, 16, 20, and it goes on into infinity. Ideally, you want the smallest number that matches, pardon me. What's the first number that matches? 12. So, if this is the process, you figure out what the LCD is. I'm getting a phone call from Ohio, I don't know why. That can't be good. I suspect that's my credit card company. And then I'll pay you while I get paid, so, which hasn't happened yet. <laughs> sorry, I don't need to make a political issue out of it, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm being a bad seed right now. I'm teaching math when I should be paying my bills. I can't yet. All right, when, my, when my employer pays me, then I will pay you. All right, um, anyhow, <clears throat> forgive me. 12 is the LCD of 3 and 4. All right. So, remember what I said before. You can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent. So if I start multiplying by 12 here and here, I had best do it to the opposite side of equals as well because that's what makes it balanced. Okay. The effect of multiplying the least common or lowest common denominator times the entire equation, both sides is that there's a cancellation effect, all right? It's going, you gotta be a little careful, but basically what's gonna happen is this. 12 over one, if you wanna think of it as a fraction, times essentially two over three. Ignore the x for right now. Whatever you get, you're just gonna attach an x to it. Cancels out the three, all right? What you will have left behind as a result of this process is that you're going to have to multiply by six, all right? Uh, pardon me, by four, all right? Why four? Because here's the minutia. All right. If you just had these two fractions, all right, three crosses out, this would be a four left over here. All right. Things that have a like factor, that is they're made of the same number, like three is made of itself, as silly as that may sound, and 12 is made of three as well, you simplify with. So three divided by itself is one, 12 divided by three is four. That realistically means, <laughs> that what's going on, the equivalent is two that was there times this leftover four. In essence, you now have eight X in place of two thirds X. Okay. A similar situation will result here. 12 times one third, you're gonna cross out this denominator by design. As long as you pick the LCD, your denominators are going away. All right. I always, as a sort of uh, cue for myself, is um, I write what I have to multiply by left over. If I divide by three, this 12 will become four again. All right. So here's the minutia if you're a little nervous. Three cancels, this will become a four. Four times the one that's there is uh, four. And it's a plus because of the plus that was there. There's an equal sign here. 12 times 3 fourths. So we'll cancel out this 4 here, right? Leave it as a 1. Every time it will be that way. And in this case, you're going to have 3 left over. So it'll be uh, 3 times 3, which is 9. Here again is the minutia. You would have a 3 from cross cancellation. Now, what do you end up with? You have 8x plus 4 equals 9. Granted, that doesn't look anything like the original problem. The original problem had fractions in it. It's an equivalent equation, right? And as long as you're consistent, no one could fault you for this, right? There are, in an Algebra 2 world, right, situations where you might end up with an extraneous solution, right? That's when you multiply or divide by a variable, right? That didn't happen here. There are no letters got multiplied. Um, uh, so you don't really have to worry about that, but this is gonna be fine.
Now we're going to pull our usual tricks. Move four via subtraction. Do it to both sides to be consistent. The fours cancel. 8x is left over. 8x is equal to 9 minus 4 is 5. Move the 8 over the equals to the opposite of multiplying, which is to divide by 8. Do it here, do it there. The 8s cancel. What are you left with? You are left with x is equal to 5 eighths. That makes sense. You had a problem that had fractions in it, and it's very likely that you would get a fraction as an answer. So it's 5 eighths. Okay? An option for you. Do you have to do it this way? No. You could, as long as you feel comfortable, or if you're armed with a calculator, I suppose, that does fractions. All right, you could brute force move one third, combine it with three fourths, uh, do the opposite of multiplying by two thirds, which would be multiplying by its reciprocal three over two. All right, or try this. All right, similar situation with decimals. I'll show you this. There's a shortcut. Which, again, even if it doesn't seem like a shortcut, I don't want to dissuade you. I take my time when I talk about things because I have to, I'm doing a bad job unless I don't. All right? A good teacher explains the fine details of things as best they can, whenever they can. So it may take me 10 minutes to explain something, but when you're putting it into practice, you'll do it a lot faster than you hear me talking about it. Okay? All right. Now... A similar thing will happen when you're dealing with a decimal problem, right? So that is, you have uh, uh, terms that have a decimal point in them, right? You are going in this case to um, eliminate decimal points. Now we're not called decimal addition or subtraction or even multiplication or division particularly difficult. However, um, it's a little intimidating only for the fact that it's slightly more alien than a regular Arabic numeral, Hindu Arabic numeral. So if you want to rig the situation to produce <clears throat> an equivalent equation by eliminating the decimal points, here's how you can do that. Right? You're going to basically multiply by powers of 10, all right? Here's the effect. If you multiply by 10, technically it's 10 to the first, all right? The effect is that it moves the decimal point once towards the right. If you multiply by 100, it moves it twice to the right. If you multiply by a thousand, which would be 10, uh, 10 to the third, all right, it's going to move something thrice, right, three times, all right, and it's like that into infinity, right? and it's always to the right when you multiply by a power of 10. If you divide by a power of 10, it moves it to the left, but we're not doing that. associate that if you had a problem like this 4x minus 0 0.48 is equal to 0 0.8x uh, plus 4 again you don't have to do it this way you can do this problem brute force and you will get the same answer brute force I mean by just moving stuff around via opposite operations it would totally work Right. It's an op it's a, an example that maybe make your life a little bit easier. Okay. Now, in this case, what I would say is look for worst case scenario. Right. That is to say, most decimal places. 
you have two examples there. You have something that stretches to the tenths place, and then you have something that stretches to the hundredths place. You want to compensate for the worst case scenario, which is this one, right? So if we had to choose between multiplying by 100 or 10, you're going to go with times 100 in this case because it's going to move the decimal place twice, okay? So what does that mean? It means that as long as I'm consistent and I multiply the entire thing times 100, that is, multiply this by 100, multiply this by 100, and this, and this, everything is copacetic, all right? Everything is legal. What's four times 100? Just 400. The effect of multiplying a decimal times 100 is to scoop this decimal place over twice, which is on purpose. And at that point, pun intended, the decimal would be there and it's superfluous. You wouldn't have to write it anymore. It's just 48. So it's minus 48 then. You have a whole number. The same thing essentially would happen here, except that you have to make one little um, addendum, one little extra correction, if you will. Um, you're going to still move two spaces, but you're going to create a void. So you're going to fill in the void with an extra zero. Decimal would be there, so it's really 80x. Right? 4 times 100, again, is 400. And this, although it doesn't look anything like the thing you started, it has the same digits, maybe. Okay. Um, it is an equivalent equation, so it's legit. Okay? And then you go about the process as you would. Which is to move stuff around. Again, uh, my own preference, and I think it's good, uh, is to move letters over to here, the left side. I justify doing that by acknowledging the sign to begin with. If it's not written, you assume it is positive. So they justify taking the whole chunk, that is the whole term, maybe x, not just the a, but the x letter with it. You do the opposite of adding, which is subtracting. And you park it strategically underneath its like term. Right? Something minus itself even if I don't know what it is, it's mysterious right now, it doesn't matter. By sheer logic alone, something minus itself cancels out of existence. The unknown thing minus itself is going to be zero. 40 minus 80, you'd end up with 320x. This is sitting here. This is sitting here. Continue. If I have decided that letters are on the left, now I'm kind of obligated at this point, my hands are tied. Numbers without letters have to be on the right. Opposite of subtracting is adding at 48. These cancel by design. You are left with 320x equals 400 plus 48 is 448. And now the last thing, is to divide by um, the coefficient here. The opposite of multiplying by 320 is to divide by 320. It's very sloppy, sorry. And if you do to one side, do to the opposite side to make it equal. Okay. 320 divided by itself is just 1, which you don't have to write. x that's left over is equal to whatever this is simplified. Now, you could use your calculator by punching in these numbers and it would it would give you the simplified answer. Um, or you could do it brute force. Right? I think when I did it, it took, uh, let's see, one, two, three. Uh, it took me three tries of simplifying, dividing by four, dividing by four, dividing by four to get to the answer. It's, it's really seven fifths as a fraction. Uh, what you would get if you did it, uh, you know, putting it like that. I would try to reduce it in its rational style first, all right? Uh, there's rules of divisibility, which would say that if a number ends in something divisible by 4, 48, and 20 definitely can be divided by 4 nicely, then you could use 4 to, to simplify. It ends up not being the best choice, though. Right? In fact, 8 isn't even the best choice. It's something larger. It's, uh, I believe, 64. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, I'm going to do it more brute force even because I think it's more obvious. All right, 320, how many can you squeeze into 448? One. The difference of that and that is eight. And 
And let's see, two and one, 128. So you're gonna have one and, uh, let's see, 128 over 320, yuck. All right, since it was a decimal problem, I should probably simplify this even further still if I can get away with doing that. And I'm gonna pull the trick that I had just mentioned at this point. Um, I'll try to divide by four. Um, but seven work better. If I divide by four, I know it will work. All right. Four goes into 12 three times, four goes into eight twice. Four goes into 32 eight times, goes into zero, zero. This is still not finished. 32 over 80. Uh, divide by four again is eight. Uh, let's see. And that goes into that 20. All right. Divide by two. Divide by two is four over 10. So what does that mean? It means 1.4. Four tenths is a four sitting in the tenth place, 0.4. All right, here's a good rule of thumb. If you started with a problem that had decimals, give decimals back. If you started with a problem with fractions, give fractions back. How you get to that point is really up to you, all right? People, I don't want to dissuade you, all right? People tend not to like fractions, but the fact of the matter is fractions are better because they preserve all of infinity. Like for instance, one third summarizes three, 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 three forever and ever and ever. And if you just use the decimals in a case like that, you might chop off the infinity and it technically changes your answer. So you do have to be careful. Okay. 1.4 is your answer. All right. Here's the last thing for this section, and I'll give you, um, refer to my worksheet that I made. This is more just useful um, summary. You'll see in a moment. solving equations, there's three things that might happen. So this is just to summarize. Um, three possible outcomes. And I'm mentioning this because I don't want you to get scared. There's more or less the normal situation. For lack of a better phrase. And then there's these two other situations. Let's call it, again, not to corrupt your opinion, corrupt your opinion but weird um, case number one. And then weird case number two. Okay, what's the normal situation? The normal situation is that everything goes according to plan. expecting, which is that a letter, it simplifies down to a letter on the left side maybe, and just a number sitting on the opposite side. It looks like this. Letter equals number. Right? As an example, I don't know, x equals 5, something like that. There's a name for that. Right? This is referred to as conditional. And if you wanted to be a geek and impress your friends, and who wouldn't want to, right? All right. Guess what? That's called conditional. All right. Um, at a party, you'll be booed out, booed out of the uh, living room. Right. Although it's Corona world, world, so who's got a living room, right? Who's got a party? Um, it is called conditional, right? Why? Because these conditions must be met. This x must equal this 5. 
That's the normal situation. What you're hoping for to happen does. After you do all of your arithmetic, all of your algebra. Right. Then there's these two cases. Right. Weird case number one. All right. It's unexpected. Something unexpected happens. In either one of these instances. Two different things, though. All right. You do all of your algebra, pull it, pardon me, let me start more basically. You do all of your arithmetic flawlessly, right? You do all of your algebra beautifully, all well balanced, right? And then in the end, you get something strange, all right? Something unexpected happens. Well, what could happen? This could happen. You end up with, um, at the very bottom of your work, all right, a number equal to some other number which is not true, right? Like for example, two and negative nine, right? No letter in sight. And you get something that is patently false, all right? Two does not equal negative nine. It's not, they don't equal, they're not the same thing, all right? You might naturally, and this is the real reason why I mention it, you might naturally reproach yourself and go, geez, I must be stupid. I must have done something wrong. No! Resist the temptation to blame yourself for everything, right? I know that in math world, right, which is adjacent to the corona world, right, right, that we are taught to um, uh, basically blame ourselves for everything. That's not always the case. And if this happens, it may not be your fault. It's just the problem. I'm going to show you something right now because I think it's cute, all right? If you look out my window, you will see... A little guy sitting in front of uh, the, what appears to be the neighbor's barbecue, all right, down here. All right, isn't he cute? This little guy, there he is, he's a, a groundhog, I guess. <laughs> he comes and visits me every day when I'm teaching math, all right? So not to digress from what we're really doing here, but I, I didn't want you to think that I was imagining um, woodland creatures. <laughs> How cute he is, right? I'm sorry. I have to share that. Uh, I take that as, to be perfectly superstitious in my own right, um, a good omen, right? Anyhow. Hello, little gopher, brown hog, whatever you are. All right, anyhow. So, a moral of the story here, when something like this happens, do not automatically go, geez, I did something wrong, I'm stupid. That's not the case necessarily, all right? Not that you should call yourself stupid anyway, all right? What it might just mean is that it happens to be this weird thing that occasionally arises, not your fault, all right? There's a name for that, all right? This is called a contradiction. A contradiction, what does it mean? It means that there's no solutions, all right? Not your fault, all right? It's just that uh, sometimes a problem arises like that. In the case of the conditional, by comparison in terms of number of solutions, it might, there's finite solutions. I don't want to say just one because perhaps there's two, you know, it depends on how complicated it is. If you had a quadratic equation, you'd have two answers, all right? Anyhow, that little guy is late today because it's the afternoon now, right? <laughs> so cute. All right. Um, last situation, we had case here. All right. Um, <clears throat> we have case number two. Also, something unexpected happens. Where you get a number equals itself. Again, that is to say, wow, that's really nice green. Adios. Lousy green. You do all of your arithmetic well, all right? You do all of your um, your algebra flawlessly. I'm distracted by a little gopher guy, groundhog. And in the end, you, you didn't get something that was false, all right? That's false. Two cannot equal negative nine, you know, as an example. Um, but you get something that totally we're not expecting. You get something like, you know, seven equals seven. Well, maybe even x equals x, right? Is that untrue? No, all right? A number is equal to itself, certainly, and the variable will be the same in theory on both sides of an equation. 
all right? Not to a fault. There is nonetheless a label for that, you know, there's a name for that. This is referred to as an identity, all right? And what that means in terms of number of solutions is that you have infinite solutions. There's many, many, many answers, if you will. So, you can either have a finite, maybe one, two, you know, several, perhaps, solutions. No solutions, or you can have infinite solutions, right? The, the point of the, the labels is just to help distinguish one from the other, all right? Uh, and to give you a little bit of comfort that you didn't do something wrong, you know, mistakenly. It's just that sometimes that happens, all right? Well, sometimes that happens. It's not the ideal situation. This is what we want to happen. Levy equals number. Right? It doesn't always. Okay. All right. Now, let's go to the next section. We'll go much quicker. I hope I'm not hallucinating. I'm breathing a lot of marker fumes and and uh, alcohol, you know, rubbing alcohol, so maybe I'm like imagining uh, woodland creatures while I'm teaching here. <laughs> and then uh, what will happen is my students will like hold up the D and go, I forget this guy, he's, he's teaching from his staircase. All right. <laughs> and imagining Disney, you know, scenarios. Right of him. should be enjoyed. Okay, um, the section that we'll discuss now all right, uh, is to basically explain this, that I have this part of the package here. There's a couple of word problems that just walk, walk you through. All right, section 6.2 is about formulas. All right, all right, remember what I was saying, it's sort of give you a, a scaffold here. A hierarchy, all right, if you will. In algebra, we have basically two types of problems. Yes, we have expressions, and yes, we have equations. And yes, it would be good to distinguish one from the other for the sake of following specific sets of rules. Right? A more specific type of equation, if you will, all right, is a formula, which is the heading of this, uh, of this section. And a formula might be what you might maybe refer to as a mathematical model. Um, I'll give you an example. The classic formula would be something like the area formula, right? Length times width, right? It's used to describe one specific shape, right? A mathematical model, which is really a formula, is more for it's more complex than that really right it has the same features you know it's an equation it has some variables in it all right but it's used to predict all right given the certain conditions like for example um, uh, famously y equals mx plus b. That's the sort of generalization. This is the line equation. If you've ever taken uh, a science course, right, they have their own version of the line equation, like in chemistry a lot. You know, at least if something has exhibits a linear relationship, this draws straight diagonal lines usually. Right? Um, they won't label them as you see here but it will be something times a variable and then adding or subtracting the constant next to it. Like, I think temperature is something that could be used as a linear relationship under certain examples, certain conditions. Anyhow, 
this is for the purpose of predicting what, say, you know, the temperature will be if you, you do something in some experiment, you know. If it's a linear relationship, this would be the appropriate model to use. Right? If there's a linear relationship between two variables, right? there could be a more complex relationship than a linear one. Logarithmic, you know, quadratic, I suppose, and so forth. All right. Anyhow, what is a formula? It's a glorified equation. All right. You will definitely see an equal sign. You will definitely see variables. Okay. What you may have to do is rearrange the variables in order to answer a question. Right. Here's the kind of thing that you would see in this section. to know, especially this first one. Right. There's the simple interest formula. Um, then there's the volume, right, specifically of a rectangular solid. The volume formula will change depending upon the the, the shape, right? Like a pyramid's volume would be a slightly more complicated formula than, say, just a rectangular box-like thing. Um, the equation of a line can have a lot of different forms as well. Um, then there's this, which I'll mention. It will be important, like, further down the pike, z-score. This for statistics. How do these look? Well, the simple interest formula looks like this. I equals P times R times T, all right? I as in interest, all right? It's interest owed or earned, depending upon whether you're giving money or you're taking money, all right? If you take out a loan, in theory, the loan could be simple interest. So you'll figure out how much you're going to owe on top of whatever the original loan was. You'll pay some interest. I don't like that, and I don't think that's a progressive society, but hey, this is the world we live in, right? Usually, it's compounded interest, which is a more complicated formula, but you don't have to worry about that. Simple interest is just three things multiplied. P stands for principal, which is a fancy way of saying the original amount of money. All right? Original bucks involved here. Um, R actually stands for rate, like APR, you've heard of annual percentage rating. That's actually a percent. If you're doing a calculation though, you will have to make it either a fraction, which is sometimes to your benefit, or the decimal equivalent to actually multiply. All right, and then there's T. T is time. The caveat is that time has to be in years. So if you've ever had a problem where you got the wrong answer, even in spite of just multiplying like you're supposed to, it probably is that. It's probably that the time was in months rather than years. All right, you'll have to convert to a fraction of a year. Okay. Volume of a rectangular solid. Um, is just this, V is in volume, is a lot of times they write this in script, and I'm kind of, they will usually bunch it together. I prefer to put the dots in between. Right. It's intuitive, right? It's length, width, and height, or well, sometimes they just call it depth. We live in um, a four-dimensional universe as far as we know, right? Well, the spatial dimensions are length, width, and depth. 
All right. All objects are three dimensional, but we live in four dimensions. The fourth dimension would be time, and that's not part of this calculation. That's the physics. Okay. The equation of a line I alluded to before is this famously. Y equals mx plus b. Okay. The real key features here are m, which is strangely the abbreviation for slope, which you can think of as basically being pitch of a line. You know, how tilted it is. All right. And the b value is the y-intercept. I'll put it here because I don't want to misspell it. Intercept. All right, which is where the line crosses the y-axis. So if you had an axis, this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis. If you had a line that happens to be a diagonal line, like that, that would be the b value, whatever that number is. Okay. Um, the z-score formula is this. I'll put this in blue as well. Z is equal to, they use Greek letters often, x minus, this is referred to as mu, it's a Greek letter, and this is lowercase sigma. It has a sort of like a spit curl uh, Superman hair. All right, sigma. Um, to give you sort of a synopsis of what that, you're not responsible for this right now, but statistics is a different chapter. Um, but if you see it, all right, don't get scared, all right, it's just another formula. Basically, z-score is a reference decimal number. It's a decimal number used as a reference for area under a curve, a bell curve specifically. Okay. The x in a case like this would be um, a data point. Um, the mu number would be the average. There's four types of averages. You could use mean, median, and mode, right? It technically is not specific in this case. If you saw X bar, that should be mean specifically. So I'm just going to generalize and say average. Sigma is something called standard deviation. Right. Leave it at that. Okay. You'll probably, the examples that I have prepared for you are just these two, all right? The worst that you would get when you have something like these two is just rearranging them. Right? Nothing too complicated. Right? They are, you know, probably subject for another day. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me walk you through these two. And then I'll stop. I'm sorry, this is running along. It's just an, better to over explain something than to under explain it, right? sort of project it onto the, the whiteboard or what have you so that I could fill it in with you. Um, anyhow, assuming you have this printed, you could just write what you have to write on here. All right, and I'll read it. All right, All right. Fatima borrows $4,000 at simple interest rate of 2.9% for three years. All right, so I'll answer it in two parts here. All right, I'm reading it backwards. How much will Fatima pay in interest only? 
by the end of three years. Right. Well, if they specify a formula, you won't have to guess. It's simple interest. Okay, fill in the given information. Principal is the original amount of money borrowed, which is $4,000. Incidentally, the dollar sign should be in the front, not at the back, because it's not a measurement. All right. If you see some bozo doing that, correct them, please. All right. I've noticed that people do that a lot nowadays. They keep putting the dollar sign at the back. It's not appropriate. It's not a measurement. It's something you counted. Counting is not the same as measuring. All right. Counting involves just counting, all right? discrete things. Measuring involves taking a tool all right, and, and comparing it to the increments on the tool. All right. and, you know. <clears throat> the rate is, I'm just going to fill it in for right now, 2.9%, and the time is three years. So if they're just asking you, um, what would this value be? after that much time is spent. The three things multiplied, you gotta dress them up just a little bit in order to do the arithmetic, whether they're calculated or not. Here's what I would do, all right? Percentages, all right? You could convert a percent to a decimal just by moving the decimal point. Twice. Now the question, the question is which direction? If you're going from something that is a percentage to begin with, all right, um, this symbol implies that you are dividing by a hundred. The effect of dividing by a hundred is that you move the decimal point twice left. Remember, when you multiply by hundred, you move right. When you divide by hundred, you move left, all right? The effect is that this would scoot over two spaces and you'd have to fill in the void. The bottom line is that you're multiplying by 0.029. Right. Um, three is in years, thankfully you just leave it like that. And you can enter these numbers as you see them in your calculator just like this. Right. If you're doing it by hand, then to do it by hand it would actually be to your benefit to do it in the fraction style because there's lots of shortcuts. 2.9%, again, if it's percent, just coincidentally happens to be a decimal as well, all right? 2.9% means divide by 100, but I'm gonna just use this style of division, all right, rather than that style of division. Just do my work. And I'll just preserve what was there. 2.9 divided by 100 is what that symbol means, okay? That means that these other things that are adjacent, I'm just gonna dress up um, to look like fractions as well. So 4,000 is a whole number, so it just has a denominator of one. Three is also a whole number, so it would similarly have a de denominator of one. And you would have this, a bunch of things being multiplied. Not to beat a dead horse, but remember how I began the lesson, all right? There's a commutative property of multiplication, which says that if you're just multiplying really, all right, you could do it in any way you want, right? I am dealing with fractions, so there's kind of a division here, but I know that I, from experience that I can get away with a couple of things. For instance, notice that this has two zeros here, and this is another round number. Usually when you borrow money, it's a round number, right? So when you're trying to convert APRs as things like that, doing the fraction incarnation of this work is better in the style of a fraction than the decimal, maybe by hand at least. All right, here's the shortcut. When you divide by round numbers, you cross out the number of the zeros that they match, pairs, if you will, right? That leaves you with just a one here, a one here, and a one here, which means that you really don't have a denominator anymore, okay? You have 40, 2.9, and three, which is just multiplication and just multiplication. I can therefore strategically do it in any order that I want. I'm going to do 4 times 3 with a 0 attached, because it's easy. 4 times 3 is just 12. With a 0 attached, that's that 0, is 120. All right? And then you just do that times 2.9, you know? Uh, all right. All right, so you have 
two point nine. And you can go through the mechanics of this, right? Nine times zero is zero. 18, carry the one, 10. Placeholder, graph paper, like I like. Um, two times zero is zero, two times nine is four, two times one is two. Zero, eight, four, three. The number of decimal places that I have to account for in this particular problem is one. So from here to here is the decimal point. That means that the simple interest is this. $348. That's what you would pay just in interest after three years. The second part of the question is this. Right. Um, what will the total amount be owed? That is, the amount you borrowed to begin with and the interest. There's a formula for that. You don't really know, need to know it. You could intuitively probably figure that out. But here is a formula if you like. It's this. They usually call it A. A as in all, I suppose, total amount. P is in principal, and I is in interest. Right. If you figured that the interest is $348, and the principal, the original amount was $4,000, then you probably intuitively know, I just have to add the two of them. All right. Which means that the total amount is $4,000, $348 owed. Okay. Right. Let me see if I can get a little buff in here. Yeah, it's not the easiest, but it will work. Blue writes very nicely, but it's tenacious. Go away. I find that if it lingers too long as well, it will stick a little bit more tenaciously. Yeah. Wait on time. Almost three hours now. Okay. Right, the other question. All right. It says use the this one here. Use the formula for the volume of a rectangular solid to calculate the width of a box of ice cream. Known dimensions given are 7 inches long, 3.5 inches tall, and 122.5 inches cubed in volume. This is an instance of you have you have the formula, you don't have to go hunting for it. Right. Formula equals length times width times height. But if you examine the information, and you should. you will see that they gave it to you all sort of botched the loop, right? So you get the length is seven inches because it's referring to it as being long. You might assume that, right? And the height is 3.5 inches because they're referring to how tall it is. And then they actually go ahead and tell you um, the volume. A telltale sign that you are given a volume dimension, or you are given the volume, is examining the units. Right? Volume is spatial, so it's three dimensions. That's what the cubic is. Right? The other two things are technically first degree. Right? Inches times inches times inches abbreviated would be inches cubed, or inches to the third, if you like. Right? What's missing? The width. Right? So even though this is the formula that is given to you, you have to rearrange it. It isn't wrong to plug in the numbers first and then rearrange all the stuff after the fact, but I would avoid doing that. Um, what you will do instead is rearrange the formula first. Rearrange to solve for w, the width. That means more or less you're going to freeze this thing in place. Uh, maybe it's appropriate to use blue. Think of it as being frozen, right? And move the other things away from it via the same process that you would numbers, right? So if you understand these three things being pressed together, 
of being multiplied, the justification in the process of moving this from here to here, or this from there to there after the fact, is to do the opposite of multiplying. What is the opposite of multiplying? And you could do it in two steps if you like, you can do it in one step. The opposite of multiplying is dividing. So you could divide by L first, both sides, and then you have this, WH, and then just do it again, divide by H to cancel, and then you would have to just sort of stick it under here with it. If it's going down in the bottom on this side, then it's going to be down in the bottom along with this buddy of L that is already there. All right? No thinking about it. A lot of times what people will do cool, um, is they will simply group these things simultaneously. So they get it done in one shot, and there's no sin in that. All right? Anyhow, what you end up with is this. You end up with W, which is written on the right side. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it's isolated. W is equal to the volume over the height times the length. Right? Now you could plug in your values, or at least write them on paper. It would be the volume of 122.5 inches cubed. If you feel funny, um, you could leave out the unit, right? It's going, there's going to be a cancellation process where the units are going to be where they should be, just in inches here in the end. Um, and then you have these two things. Height is 3.5. Just deal with the numbers if you prefer. And then just here. Now, if you have a Gucci $100 calculator, like a graphing calculator, I'm not really responsible for that, um, you could very carefully enter this exactly as it looks here. And I would do that. Um, in a, in a, you don't really have to worry about significant digits or anything like that, or you know, rounding errors or something. All right, but to get in the habit of trying to do your calculations, you know, with your calculator if you're using it, last. All right, after you've done all the arranging, it's a good strategy. Anyhow, what you could do, just because you're not going to get any decimal numbers in this case, is just straighten this out. All right, in which case, what are you going to get? You're going to get uh, 24. 0.5 inches squared, and this is sitting underneath 122.5 inches cubed. Enter that, divide, enter that, right? and you'll have it. Right? What you'll end up with is that this is 5 inches. Right? Why? Well, if you're worried about the inches units, then you're not really responsible for that. Inches squared cancels out inches cubed, leaving just 1. You subtract the exponents when you divide. Um, I'll do one more thing and then I'll stop. This process of rearranging is just to reinforce the skill of algebraic balancing, manipulating equations to your advantage. Um, that's why it's coming up now. Um, that other thing. If you had, um, <clears throat> if you had to uh, solve the line equation for a specific letter, let's say you solve for slope m, and you know that this is the line equation in slope intercept form anyhow. This is referred to as slope intercept form because of the features that are there specified the slope and the intercept, the y-intercept. Um, you just have to go about the process as you would again if you had just regular numbers. All right? If you're trying to solve the slope, then you want to get this alone. You might draw a box around it. That means you're going to move this over equals, and eventually you're going to move this over equals. All right? Do the addition subtraction portion of this first. Okay, so I'll make a table. What is the opposite of adding mysterious B here? Subtracting B. 
It doesn't have a like term. You don't know what Y is. So the best that you could do is just simply park it underneath Y. Right. Nonetheless, there's a cancellation effect by sheer logic alone. Even if I don't know what something is, something minus itself is logic from zero. These two things could at least be written adjacent, you know, since I can't mesh them together. This MX is left over, and it's understood that two things pressed together are being multiplied. What is the opposite of multiplying by X? Dividing by X is the cancellation effect again, just sheer logic. As long as you're assuming X is not zero, it's something divided by itself, which is usually just one. If you did that here, do it here. The whole thing, not just one or the other. That means that M is equal to Y minus B sitting on top of X. Okay? Let me leave it at that. Okay? Uh, for homework, um, try uh, to do uh, section 6.1 and 6.2 uh, by Wednesday. All right, on Wednesday we'll do, I think it's section 6.5. Okay? All right, be careful out there. See you later.